Well, welcome once again to our Tuesday night Bible study here at the Lynn Pentecostal Church in Leicester. And we're looking uh, through the book of Hebrews, uh, verse by verse, step by step. Uh, we've reached chapter 4, so we've done three uh, chapters already. <clears throat> but just a little recap. Um, the whole reason that the book of Hebrews was written was to combat the false teaching of the Judaizers who were trying to drag believers back under the old covenant, taking them away from Christ uh, and causing them to um, live by the, the, the law of Moses and, and the dietary laws and the ceremonies and the festivals, even to the point of once again sacrificing animals. So they wanted to drag them back into the old covenant uh, out of the new covenant into the old covenant. And they were putting pressure on them. And so the Christians really were, were being persecuted by their fellow countrymen, if you like. I think you'll remember, if you know, and uh, if you've read the book of uh, Revelation, <clears throat> that there's one particular church where um, Jesus refers to the, the, the synagogue there as a synagogue of Satan. And so these uh, Christians were being had put pressure on to go back uh, into the old covenant ways and to abandon their faith in Christ himself. And so the way that the uh, author to the Hebrews combats that is to exalt Christ, basically, to show us who he really is and what he's really done in great detail. And he began by saying that in times past, God spoke through the prophets, but now he's spoken to us in these last days through his son. And so Jesus is God's word and God's final word. There's nothing to add to the Bible. There's nothing to add to it. You know, the word of God is the word of God. It's a, it's a full uh, book. Also tells us that the worlds were made by Jesus and sustained by him as well. It also tells us that Jesus is the express image of the Father in heaven. Remember Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so all the time we're seeing Jesus uh, exalted. He also goes on to say in the first three chapters that, he, that Jesus is higher than Moses. Moses was a servant in in the, in the people of God, in the house of God, but Jesus is the builder of the house. He is greater than Moses. He also says that um, he exalts him as well above Abraham. And remember, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. The first three chapters tell us that Jesus was higher than, is higher than the angels, and he goes on to say, uh, Quoting scripture, Old Testament scripture, let all the angels worship him. So all the time we're getting this exaltation of Jesus. We also see in the first three chapters that Jesus now sits on the right hand of the majesty on high, that he's a builder of the house, that he has purged our sins and reconciled Christians to God. And so you see this wonderful picture being built concerning uh, Jesus. And so the author to the Hebrews really exalts Christ to his rightful place, explaining who he is and what we have as Christians in him. Why would we abandon Christ to go back into the Old Testament? That's basically into the Old Covenant. That's basically what the author to the Hebrews is saying. You don't, abandon, you don't abandon Christ to go back into the old covenant. We have a new and living way, a better covenant and a better sacrifice. You see, Jesus provided through his life and death on the cross a better covenant and a better sacrifice. And it's the power of the blood of Jesus that is able to forgive our sin. And the blood of Christ never runs out. And it's a once and for all sacrifice. And we enter into it by faith. We don't make the sacrifice. The sacrifice has already been made and provided. Back then, you would have to go and make a sacrifice or take the sheep or take the goat 
to provide the sacrifice. And then you'd have to go back again. And over your lifetime, you would have to go back numerous times under the old covenant to, to make that sacrifice once again so that your sins will be covered. But we as Christians, we enter in to a, 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 a work that has been completed. And it's a once and for all sacrifice, never to be repeated. It never runs out. It never loses its power. The blood of Jesus Christ is able to cleanse us from all of our sin. So why would we abandon all of that to go back to an old covenant way of doing things that is now defunct and ended and has no power? You see, the book of Hebrews could be summed up in just a few words. Justification by faith justification by faith we are justified just as if i'd never sinned justified as if i'd never sinned i am justified before god not because i'm living by the law or ceremonies or whatever else may have may have you know happened under the old covenant all the sacrifice of animals but through christ and so i need to stay there i need to remain there but these Christians were being persecuted and put pressure on to go back under the old covenant way of doing things. You see how important justification by faith is? <clears throat> you see, for centuries after the church was formed, people were under the deception of Roman Catholicism, which basically taught, put your faith in the church, you know, Mary, the mother of God, and, and all the ceremonies and whatever else, be a good person, do this. Justification by faith was lost. But it's only when Martin Luther realized, under the influence of God, that this wasn't right, and he nailed his, I think it was 99 Thesis on the door of the church, basically saying, you know, this is what I disagree with the Roman Catholic Church. And one of them was that, that justification by faith, that we're justified by faith and not by works. And there began the Protestant Reformation and the freedom that all that brought. Once again, when the people moved back, uh, by faith and, and began to trust in Christ and his finished work once again rather than trusting in false religion. And so you see how easy it is to be deceived. And many people over many centuries were deceived into thinking they were actually saved when they were not. And so now we find ourselves then in, in chapter 4. In chapter uh, 2, Chapter 2 follows on from chapter 1, we, we read therefore, in chapter 3 we read wherefore, and then in chapter 4 we read letters therefore, and so one follows after the other. And so in verse 1 of chapter 4 it says this, here's the exhortation, let us therefore fear, Lest the promise of being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. God has promised us a rest in this life. A rest in this life. A rest from works. A rest in Christ. Anything outside of Christ's works, those who put their faith and trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior and what he's done on the cross, enter into rest. We're resting from self-justification works. Verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as to them. Now them, were they, who is referring to there is the wilderness journey of the Israelites. Those who left Egypt, 20 years and above, that's who he's referring to. And he says this, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. 
So actually, the gospel of Jesus Christ, in a roundabout way, was actually preached to the Israelites back during their wilderness journey. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. You see, God had provided for them a land. He provided the land. All they had to do was follow him into the land. He'd already provided it. This is where you're going to enter into. You're going to enter into Canaan. And the author to the Hebrews likens faith in Christ to the Israelites entering into Canaan. They're entering into what God has already provided. They're entering into rest, if you like. And so he likens faith in Christ as entering into Canaan, like the Israelites were supposed to do. And so God basically had already provided the land of Canaan for Israel. It was already there for them. All they had to do was take it. It was theirs already. Yes, they'd have to fight for it, but it was theirs. There will be battles to fight, but the war was already won because God had already provided for them. And all they had to do was step forward by faith. But you know, the Bible says without faith, we cannot please God. And the Israelites got so far in their journey, but when they got to the very borders of Canaan, they just didn't enter in because they didn't have the faith to enter in to what God had already literally provided for them. And so they just didn't have enough faith to enter in. <clears throat> you know, what we do as Christians, we step out, don't we, in faith. That's what we do. We step out in faith. And it begins, our journey begins. Our journey begins when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Saviour and the work that he's done. That's where, it doesn't be, begin before then, but it begins when we accept him into our lives as our Lord and Saviour. Verse 3, For we which have believed, we do enter in to rest. What does that mean? Well, that means we enter in. We enter into the finished work of Jesus. And we enter into rest. God has already provided a rest for us. A rest from works. You cannot, you cannot earn your salvation. Basically, that's what he's saying. You cannot earn your salvation. Nobody can. But Jesus has provided the salvation. He's died upon the cross. He lived the perfect life. And so when a Christian puts their faith and trust in him and he becomes their Lord and Saviour, they literally enter into rest. And it's very clear here in verse 3 that we who have believed do enter into rest. So if you're a Christian believer born again tonight, then you have already entered in to, because you're not trying to earn your salvation anymore. You're not trying to justify yourself before God because it's impossible to do that. Living by the law of Moses, going back under the old covenant, even to the point of sacrifice, and it's all gone. It's pointless. It's self-justification. We have a righteousness that's not our own, but that God has already provided. So he has provided it, just like he provided, just like he provided the land of Canaan for the Israelites, but they failed to enter in because they simply didn't have the faith. But you have put your faith and trust in Christ. You have entered in to that rest that the Bible talks about. For we who have believed do enter that rest, but as he said, I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished before 
the foundation of the world. For he spoke in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest on the seventh day from his works. Remember the six days of creation? What did God do on the seventh day? Nothing. He didn't sit down and go, oh, that was, that was hard work. I need to take a rest, put my feet up. It wasn't that kind of a rest. He just did nothing. It's a Sabbath day. It's a day of rest. God did nothing. And that's why I guess we're called on one day of the week anyway to, 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 to set that day apart at least to, to come and worship God together as a, as a day of rest, quite literally. So as Christians, then, we've already entered into that rest because we don't try to earn our salvation. But we believe that we're already saved in Christ. And it's, it's just like God's seven days, seventh day of rest. We rest from our works. We have faith in Christ. We put our faith in him rather than ourselves. That's, that's, just, that's how it is. That's how it works. That's what it means. Go back to Romans chapter 4 and verse 3 in our Bibles. Romans 4 and verse 3. For that saith the, for what saith the scripture? What does the Bible say? Abraham, well, let's read verse 2. For if Abraham was justified by works, he hath wherefore to glory, but not before God. For what says the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Remember when God, he was standing outside looking up at the stars, and said, so you're, you know, you're, you're, you know, sons and daughters, <clears throat> there will be more than the stars in the sky. And Abraham believed God. He believed him. He knew it was true. He put his faith in him. And that is what counted as righteousness. Now, to him that works, in other words, if you try and earn your salvation, to the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. So you're almost putting God in your debt. You're, you're saying to him, look what I've done. Look how good I am. I've earned my salvation. But you can't earn it. God, you can't put God in debt. But to him that worketh not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And you're righteous in the sight of God because you put your faith in Jesus Christ, who lived the perfect life on your behalf. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man to whom God imputeth righteousness without works. We're righteous in God's sight. The amazing thing is that Jesus' perfect life that he lived is given to us when we come to him by faith. We enter in to a rest. We're, we're given the righteousness of Christ. You're clothed in it. You're clothed in his righteousness. I stand in that. I rest in that. I trust in that. I don't trust in my own works, my own deeds, may, whatever they may be, however good I may think I am. I cannot add to it. I cannot earn it. I cannot make it even more secure than it already is because Jesus' life is a perfect life and I am clothed in a robe of righteousness by faith not by works. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Hallelujah. I have freedom in Christ. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are heavy laden. Do you know, 
If you try to earn your salvation, you will only put a heavy load on your back. Come to me. But that's what the Pharisees did. They put a heavy load on the back of the people, didn't they? Come to me, all you are heavy laden. And what's he say? I will give you rest. Hallelujah. We rest in Christ. Amen. It's simple. It's not hard. And we have to remain in that. You see, there are two types of followers. Two types of followers. There are those who are professors and those who are possessors. And there's a big difference. Because many people, many people have a cultural religion or an intellectual belief. But it's not an inner faith. Inner faith is different. You can go to church all your life and still not be saved. You have an intellectual faith. You do the things the church tells you to do. You do the ceremony, and whatever it may be. But you're not born again. And many people are like that. There are many people who, who go to church and profess Christ, but actually are not actually born again. Jesus said, many people will call me Lord, Lord, but not everyone will enter the kingdom of heaven. So there are professors, but then there are possessors. Those who have an inner faith and an experience of God through Jesus Christ. So if we turn back now in our Bibles to uh, the book of Ezekiel and chapter 36 and verse 26. Ezekiel... <clears throat> 36 verse 26. A new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Remember when you first became a Christian? <clears throat> everything changes. Some more dramatically than others, but everything begins to change. Your attitudes change. The things you say change. The way you think changes because the Holy Spirit is now within you and you've come to faith in Christ. And so everything begins uh, to change. You know, there was a time, if you think of yourself as a pencil, think of yourself as a pencil. Before you were a blunt pencil, your conscience was seared. It was blunted. You said and did whatever you wanted to say and do. You never thought about it. But as a Christian, things change. It's like having a, a pencil that's just been sharpened with a real sharp edge to it. And now everything that you do is weighed in the balance. The things you say is weighed in the balance. And you know when you're about to say something and you know you shouldn't say it. And you know that you're about to do something and you know if I do that I'm going to sin. And so this is something you never experienced before. Why? Because I will put my spirit within you and I will cause you to walk in my ways, says the Lord. And so a Christian really is somebody who's had a spiritual heart transplant. Because that's what we've had. He will take a stony heart of unbelief and give you a heart of flesh. And so that's what it means. That's You are born again by the grace of God. The stony heart has been removed, and now a heart of flesh has been put in its place. Back to uh, Hebrews and <clears throat> chapter 4, verse 5.
And in this place again, he says this, if they shall enter my rest, seeing therefore it remains that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached, that's the wilderness people, entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limits a certain day, saying to David, today, after so long a time, as it is said, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. For if Jesus had given them, the wilderness journey people, rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest has also ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labour therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief as those in the wilderness did. So can you see that? So he's talking about faith in Christ and putting your trust in him and doing away with self-righteousness as entering into rest. You see... It's a, it's a strange sin because he said, let us labour to enter into rest. That's an odd thing to say, isn't it? How can you work to enter into rest? I thought you were entering into... What does it mean to labour, to, to work, to enter into rest? It doesn't make sense, does it? <clears throat> There's a problem, you see, with, with mankind because mankind's natural instinct is to work. Do you know, when you're faced with a holy and righteous God, the natural thing to do is to do something. I better, I, better, I better sort myself out. I better become more righteous. I better live by the law. It's the natural thing. The natural thing is to man, for man to work and earn his or her salvation. It's a natural instinct of fallen man. Do you know when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and they realised that they were naked, they tried to cover up their nakedness by their own actions and by doing their own thing. They tried to cover up their nakedness. It's all about relying on yourself, your own effort, your own ability. But letting go of self-reliance it's not easy, is it, for our natural human, fallen human nature. It's not easy to let go and let God. It's not easy. The natural instinct of man is to try to earn, to try to do better, to try to justify themselves in the eyes of God. And the Bible tells us you can't do it. And putting your trust in someone who has already lived a perfect life on your behalf, that takes faith. Just like the Israelites needed to have faith to enter into Canaan, they failed. And so it seems that some get so far, but don't enter in the true uh, faith in Christ. It's all about letting go of your own self-reliance and trusting that Jesus has justified you in the sight of God. But it sometimes takes effort. You've got to make Take effort to stay there, to remind yourself, to not give in to the instinct to, to try to, to somehow make yourself better in the eyes of God and think that you're going to get a better place in heaven or that you're going to be more secure by trying to. And that's what the Judaizers were trying to get the Christians back then to do, to go back under the old covenant and to put their faith and trust in their own works once again. I used to take my uh, daughter swimming when they were younger. <clears throat> the oldest took her, and then the youngest, I began to we began to take her swimming. And I remember standing there uh, in the shallow end, and uh, she just learned to sort of swim a little bit, uh, but not much. And then I said, right, stand on the, stand on the edge. And I, and I stood a few feet away, and I said, I'll catch you. You know, just, you know. And so I remember that she... She stood there and she was looking and she's looking at me and looking at me. And I said, come on, come on, I'll catch you. 
I won't let you go. I won't let you drown. You know, I'll, I'll catch you. And she's looking and she's looking at me and she's looking at the water. She's looking at me and, yeah, no, no. <laughs> and she couldn't do it. She, she, she just didn't quite have enough faith in me for some reason uh, to, to, to just jump and rely on me rather than on herself. And, and it's not easy for it's the instinct of a person is, is of a fallen nature is to actually try to work for their own salvation instead of putting your tr faith and trust in the one who has already justified you and to stay there. The hymn writer said this, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I shall not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. See, the hymn writer knew all about that. Verse 12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight but all things are naked and open to the eyes to him who, to whom we have to do. In other words, to whom we're going to one day have to give an account. God's word. God's word. The Bible. God's word. Do you know what the Bible says of itself? The Bible says this. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for preaching and teaching and training in righteousness so that the man of God, you know, may do the work of God, basically. All scripture is God-breathed because the people who wrote this book, all of it, were under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit when they wrote it. It's God's word, all of it. I believe all of it's God's word. All scripture is God-breathed. Not just a bit of it, but all scripture is God-breathed. It's a living word. The problem is that we're not always alive to it. I remember years ago, I used to think, oh, make your word alive to me, Lord. No, 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 no. No, make, it should, I should have said, make me alive to your living word. There's a difference. The word of God is living and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's people that need to be quickened. We need to be quickened. We need the Holy Spirit. And there are times, and you know that, and I know that, when sometimes the word just jumps out the page. And you know it's God speaking to you, you know, at this time, on this subject, on this day. And it's yours and it's for you. And sometimes that happens. But all the time, the word of God is living. Question is, am I alive to it? So my prayer is not make your word living, Lord, but make me alive to your living word. Because the word of God is living and sharper than any two-edged sword. Do you know, the Bible has had the greatest effect on the world that anything or anyone has ever had and ever will have. It's even greater than the two-edged Roman gladius sword. It's even greater than that. You know, Rome, 500 years or so, its glory has long gone. The sword, the gladius, the two-edged sword, it came and it went, but God's word lives forever. Hallelujah. It's a living word. And look at... When you look around the world, look at the influence that God's word has had upon the whole nations. I don't know how many people have been believers over the centuries since Adam and Eve. Billions? I'd have thought so. I mean, it's incredible, isn't it? Look at the effect that the Bible has had, God's word has had throughout the ages. Philosophy and religion can only reform a person 
But it's a Bible that can only transform a person. Only the Bible can transform. Religion, philosophy, it can reform, but only God's word can transform. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what the word of God says. And we see that, and we see that on many different occasions, but I'd like to pick out one, and it's probably the most famous one, and it's Acts chapter 2 and verse 36. You'll know, no doubt, uh, what I'm referring to, Acts chapter 2 and verse 36, a perfect example of God's word literally piercing the heart, the bones and the marrow and the sinew. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made the same Jesus who you, Yes, you, you Jews, have crucified both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? You see, that's the word of God. That's the gospel, isn't it? Being preached. Whenever you share... God's word with friends, family, work colleagues, or anybody else, it, it never goes to waste. <clears throat> I remember working with a particular guy, and one day he, 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 he sort of, there was just the two of them, one day he, he leant against the bench, he folded his hands and said, Right then, he says, This Christianity thing, sum it up. Sum it up. How do you sum up? Christianity. Now, before I'd I'd sort of, you know, when witnessing to friends and so, I'd, I'd gone through the whole of Genesis right through to and all that, and, 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 and you know, people are going, you can see their eyes sort of glazing over because it's too much information, too much information. But you know, sometimes just a short verse of scripture is enough. And you know what? They can take that verse of scripture. And, and, and that little bit is enough. You don't have to go through absolutely everything, the whole 66 books of the Bible. Three hours later, he doesn't even know what you've been talking about because he can't take it all in. People can only take so much in. And so I thought to myself, what am I going to say? How am I going to... <sighs> okay, thank you, Lord. I said, okay, I said to him, you want to know? You want to know? I'll sum it up for you. I'll sum it up for you. I says, Jesus said this. Right, are you listening? <laughs> says, are you listening? He says, yeah, I'm listening. I says, are you sure you're listening? He says, you take this away. Jesus said this. Unless a man is born again, he will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, you take that away and think about it. And he did. I don't know what he did with it. But uh, <laughs> one, one verse, one verse, one verse. But what a verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him. One verse. Sometimes one verse is enough. One time, sometimes one verse is enough. But how can you get round a verse like that? You can't get round it, can you? Unless you're born again, you'll never enter into heaven. Wow. You can't get round that. Try it. You can't get round it. There's, it's just there, isn't it? Bang. It's like a sword that just cuts through everything. There it is. It's like playing tennis. <clears throat> you know, you play tennis, don't you? And then he or she hits the ball, and suddenly the ball is in your court. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? The ball's there. What are you going to do with it? You can let it go and ignore it, or you can do something with it. You know, when, you, when verses of Scripture like that are preached, People have to sit up and listen. And God can use one verse, and that person takes it away, and they think, unless I'm born again, I know. You mean I won't enter into heaven unless I'm born again? Well, yeah, that's right. You won't enter to It's as simple as that, isn't it? You can't get around it. Verses like this, the word of God is like a two-edged sword. Last couple of verses then, and... Um, 
verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast. Let's not give it up. Hold fast your profession. Hold fast your faith in him. For we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet he was without sin. So now, after almost four chapters, the author to the Hebrews is introducing Jesus now as our high priest. And that would go right to the heart of the Judaizers because they knew exactly what the role of the high priest and what he had to do. You see, the high priest, Israel's high priest, and there was only one at any one time, his main thing was to go into the Holy of Holies and make that, offer that sacrifice. First of all, he had to make a sacrifice for himself and then he would take the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement and go in and make a sacrifice on behalf of the whole of Israel. He had to have a rope tied around his foot so that if, if something went wrong and he didn't make the right sacrifice and God didn't accept it and God slew him, although we don't have, I don't know if there's ever been, been a record of that ever happening, they could pull him out from under his curtain. So, and he'd have bells tied around his ankles and keep going like that to make, make sure he's still alive because entering into the presence of God he just couldn't do it only one man once a year with a sacrifice could have, and he was the high priest but what it talks about here uh, as Jesus that we have a high priest who has literally passed into the heavens he hasn't passed into the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. He hasn't passed into the Holy of Holies in the temple. He's passed into the Holy of Holies. Heaven itself on our behalf. Not an earthly high priest doing an earthly task, but Jesus, our heavenly high priest, who has entered in on our behalf. Hallelujah. See the way the author is exalting Christ? Now he's bringing in this high priest role that we see. Verse 16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Do you know, under the old covenant, you couldn't do that. Why go back to the old covenant? You couldn't do it. You couldn't enter into the Holy of Holies. You couldn't enter into the throne of grace. You could go as far as the outer court and the altar of sacrifice. You take your sacrifice, the priest will take it from you, that's as far as you went. The priest would then make the sacrifice. He could go to the bronze laver, then he could enter into the holy place, but even he couldn't even go into the holy of holies. But we're told in verse 16, because of what Jesus has done, we can go boldly to the throne of grace and obtain mercy and find grace to help. In time of need. Hallelujah. I can enter into the very presence of God because Jesus has passed into the heavens as our great high priest. Quickly, uh, Matthew chapter 27 and verse 50. Matthew 27, verse 50. Then Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in two from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quakes, and the rocks were split in two, or rent. The veil in the temple was torn in two. Do you know the veil was, was made of, of material that was this thick, four inches thick? Imagine that. They say it was either 40 or 60 feet high. Now that's some curtain. You're not going to go down a Dunelm and find a curtain pole that's strong enough to hold that, let me tell you. I mean, that is, it's, apparently it took 300 priests to manhandle it. That's some curtain, isn't it? 
That's the veil, four inches thick, 60 feet high in the temple. There it is. <laughs> you can't get to God. Only the priest, high priest once a year can go in. But when Jesus died, torn in two. And it said, apparently, that if you get a horse one side and a horse the other side, tie a rope to it, they could not rip it. It's that thick. You could, it's that strong. You couldn't, it's like a block of concrete. It wasn't ripped from the bottom to the top. It's as though God just reached down and went, <sighs> when Jesus died and he said, it is finished, and he cried with a loud voice, unto you I give my spirit. <sighs> it was ripped. And now the Holy of Holies, the very presence of God, we can enter in now boldly to the throne of grace. And our final verse is in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. You see, under the new covenant in Christ, we have an access to God that was never possible under the old covenant. We can enter right in to the very presence of God. And that's what Jesus offers us. That's what we have in him as believers. We've entered into rest. We rest from our works. We can enter into the very throne of God himself. Jesus offers us, offers us far more than the Old Testament or the Old Covenant could ever have. And so, as Christian believers, you know, we're told to put our trust in him, to put our faith in him, not ourselves, but in him, because he has done all these things for us, and he indeed is our great high. So let's labour to stay that way. Let's labour to rest in him. Let's not be moved. Let's not think that somehow I can add to my salvation by being a good person or, or in, some, in some way secure my salvation even more. It's not possible. I'm saved as, as much as I'm ever going to be saved. I can't get more saved than I already am. I can't get more justified in the sight of God than I already am. So let's rest in him. Hallelujah. And recognize that as Christians, we are justified uh, by grace through faith and not through works. Amen. Let's pray, shall we?